On March 21st, 2012, Ross Bjork was announced as the seventh athletic director in Ole Miss history. Starting in September of 2012, the Rebels and the NCAA have jointly investigated issues connected to women's basketball, track and field, and football, including a number of high-profile developments that have generated national headlines. Over 90% of Bjork's tenure thus far in Oxford has been marked by continued investigations. In addition, July of 2017 brought the notable resignation of former head football coach Hugh Freeze due to behavior unfitting of the university. In this exclusive interview with Athletic Director Yu, Bjork reflects on key moments over the last seven years, experiences preparing for and subsequently time in front of the Committee on Infractions, the influence and assistance of outside counsel, communication strategies, how he's changed as a leader, his own job security, and ultimately how he's led the Rebels through the collective crisis. Ross, why are you choosing to tell this story? Thank you, Jason, for the opportunity to, uh, to you know, just get the word out about you know, all the challenges that we've had in uh, our program here at Ole Miss, but also how do we move forward you know, in a positive manner. And I believe that uh, you know, as leaders in college athletics, you know, as educators, you know, we can all learn. And I'm a product of college athletics. I played Division II football. I think everything that, that I've been through as, as a leader in college athletics was set up by my experience as a student athlete. So I love it. I love what it stands for. I think that if it's done right, it's one of the best leadership and life learning opportunities that we can give our young people you know, in American uh, society. So when you mix college athletics and you mix higher education, to me there's no better platform. And so I wanted to tell this story so other leaders in athletics, my colleagues, ADs, compliance professionals, just people learning the business of athletics can understand what we went through. We don't ever want this to happen again on our campus, but we also want to make sure that, hey, if we can impact some change in college athletics by, by talking about this, by telling the story, if other people can learn some lessons along the way, let's get that word out there. Let's talk about it. Let's be transparent. Because I, I think that in today's world where there's so much scrutiny, where you almost have to be perfect in handling these type of matters, let's learn from it. Let's have best practices. Let's allow people to, uh, to showcase what we went through so it doesn't happen here again, but also if somebody goes through it, they can learn some lessons along the way. Sure. So let's go back in time uh, seven years ago, almost to the day here. Uh, you get to Oxford, you're now the athletic director, and one of the first issues that you have to deal with is some potential infractions um, with your women's basketball coach who was just on the job for a short amount of period as well. You decide to make a move and terminate his contract uh, and that essentially opens up a investigation by the NCAA into the women's basketball program and several other programs. If you can go back before you essentially open that Pandora's box and have a two-minute conversation with yourself knowing now what you've gone through over the last seven years, what would you say? That's a great question. And I think you, you anytime you go through a, a six year plus process, you always can, can learn. And you know, now that you have the game film, right, you can say, boy, we should have called this play when they ran this defense or those sort of things. And so you look back to that, that day before, if you will, that we met with Adrian Wiggins on a, on a Saturday morning and we had an off uh, football weekend and so there was nothing going on and, and we had got a lot of information on the table. So what I would tell myself is, how do we isolate this? How do we make this process go as fast as possible to make sure that it only impacts one program? And that's what we would tell ourselves, not knowing what was coming later, but that's what we would reflect on is to say, Let's take this, let's put it in a box as fast as possible, even though we had a lot of information on the table that we were working with the NCAA on. Let's button this thing up, let's move this case forward, let's get it done as quick as possible so that if something else comes up, we can isolate that as well. So that's what we would have told ourselves. Ultimately, we did the right thing with, with Adrian and he could no longer be our coach and we had to hold him accountable for a, a very short window of time but we took the right steps. But we would tell ourselves, let's get this done, let's move forward, and let's button this up so that our program is not impacted as a whole like it was as, as this uh, saga continued. Sure. Hindsight, of course, is always 2020. 20 no um, So several months later, we get to signing day. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and Ole Miss has one of its best recruiting classes ever, ranked fifth in the country. Uh, and of course, in six years ago now, social media is still kind of a little bit of in its right. infancy, but a lot of people start talking about how did Ole Miss pull together such an amazing class? Uh, perhaps things were not done in the right way. Uh, and your then head football coach, Hugh Freeze, uh, sends out a tweet, uh, and I'm gonna read it here. If you have facts about a violation, send it to compliance at Ole Miss. If not, please do not slander these young men or insult their families. In retrospect, perhaps that tweet was um, did more harm than good. And so now knowing what we know, how do you ensure that your entire staff, your administrators, your coaches, your student athletes, are on the same page when it comes to communication, especially in, in a situation where there's an ongoing investigation and you may be rocking the boat a little bit too much. Right. Lots of things there, obviously, you know, Jason, that went into that, that type of communication. But also, you know, when you have, before this uh, tweet was even sent out, we, were, we, we did not have any contact from the NCAA related to football. That was after a, a big recruiting weekend. And so, that tweet obviously should not have been sent out because that just invited an onslaught of speculation. And so there was already some noise and we had really got a lot of that noise, you know what, figured out what it was and there was nothing to a lot of that noise. But that tweet invited, you know, more speculation than it did to say, hey, we're trying to do the right thing, which we, which we obviously are every single day. But that tweet invited that. And so, how do you ensure that communication? First of all, in any, any type of these processes, it starts with you can't communicate. You can't talk about it. It's all confidential. No one can speak on it. Your attorneys tell you that. The NCAA tells you that. And so I think the balance there is our coach, his style, our previous coach, his style was to be active on social media. That was, that was his platform. He believed in that. The counsel that we gave him regarding that tweet was, hey, don't do that. We don't think that's a good idea. We think that'll invite more questions. You know what? We can't really control what people say. We can control what we know, and we can figure out if there's something to it, but that, that will probably invite you know, more activity. And sure enough, it did. And so he decided that he wanted to protect the young men that he was building relationships with. He wanted to protect their families and he said, I have to do this. I believe that it's the right thing to do. I've built this social media platform. And so how do you ensure that moving forward? I think what you have to do is you have to constantly communicate. You have to make sure everyone understands the impact. And we have to make sure that if we, if we need to embargo something, then maybe there's more controls on it moving forward. So that, that's a lesson that we can learn is that, hey, you want your coaches to be active you want them to have platforms, you want them to showcase the program, but if it brings harm, we need to stop that. And obviously that, that tweet, in retrospect, was a, was a big mistake. Do you think that maybe there was some self-preservation um, thought process there for him in terms of trying to defend his own reputation and not just that of the student athlete? You know, I, I think one of the things um, that we can all do as leaders is you have to compartmentalize, you have to drown out the noise. And I think a lot of times when you're in these high profile positions, you get heavily influenced by the noise and you can't. And so I think that was a part of it. Perhaps there was a, a self-preservation aspect of, hey, I believe in what we're doing. I believe in our program, which we all did. We all, we're all trying to do the right things and we still believe that we, that we do the right things as, as well as anybody, and, and we have all kinds of structure and compliance. So over the next two years, there's a lull in the investigation, um, and then Laramie Tunsil, one of your football student athletes, gets in a fight with his stepfather, uh, and as a result of that, his stepfather comes out and starts telling the media, telling the NCAA, uh, all kinds of things, including the fact that his son or his stepson was meeting with uh, NFL agents, which is obviously against the rules. Um, and many believe that somehow Ole Miss missed things that were happening right underneath their nose for two years 
What would you say to that? What would you say about whether or not you should have known what was happening within your football program, particularly because there was an investigation ongoing during that period? You know, there, there's a lot of twists and turns, and that, that I think it gets to the complexity uh, of these cases. We, we felt that this case could have been and, and should have been over several times, including really the spring of 2015. We, were, we thought we were days away or, you know, several weeks away from receiving our notice of allegations, which at that time would have been, you know, minimal violations with the current staff at that time, some past violations related to football, and then we had a few things in track, and then we had the women's basketball case. So it was really a contained case where it was manageable. We were hopeful to get our notice of allegations in the spring of 2015, and then all of a sudden here comes late June, and this altercation, you know, takes place with, with Laramie and, and his stepdad. And it really took the case to a whole nother level, both publicly and obviously, you know, with the investigation, you know, privately. And so what we pride ourselves on, and this is what we argued throughout the case, is that we have the right kind of education. We have the right kind of monitoring. Laramie and his family were part of our high profile student athlete education. The stepdad was in several of those meetings where we're constantly talking about, hey, look, we think you're going to be a top 10 draft pick, a first round pick. You're one of the best left tackles, if not the best in college football. We had other athletes that were fitting that, that, that same category. We have to educate them differently. They have other things that maybe a normal student athlete wouldn't have come at them. And so what we would say is we had a high profile education. Everyone knew what the rules were, however, you know, temptation comes into play, family dynamics come into play. Some of the things that were alleged by the stepdad had already been looked into as a result of all that noise back in 2013. Some of that was left over in 2014. And a lot of those things were just knocked off the table. They, they weren't true. There was, no, there was no facts. What the NCAA will tell you is they always have a right if they get new information you know, to look into things further. And so new information came from the stepdad. He, he alleged around 27, you know, items, five of which ended up being, you know, allegations, uh, which turned into things that we admitted to based on the fact. And so what I would say is, again, everything within our control, all the education as part of the investigation in 13 and 14, several of those items had been looked into nothing was found and then it reopened it with with that fight so it, it turned it into a more of a high profile case um, we had it managed at the beginning and then it turned into a, a, another realm and laramie set out seven games that fall and we got our notice in 2016 and and then we had another incident which i'm sure you'll you'll get to sure so to that point you get your notice the first notice of allegations in the beginning of 2016, you start the process of answering it and we get the draft day. And I think everybody that has been around the Ole Miss program as a student athlete, as a, uh, a member of the university and, and fans knew where they were uh, when that video leaked on draft night of Laramie Tunsil. Uh, and there were a number of accusations made in that video uh, along with the fact that one of your assistant ADs had been paying Laramie, uh, that he was accepting money from, from somewhere in the university. Did your response or your strategy to answering the notice of allegations change when that video came out? Yeah, I think if we go back to January of 2016, when we first got the, got the first notice, late January, what we should have done at that point, and again, we got the playbook now, we got the film, is we should have released the, the notice of allegations publicly. And again, we start with, hey, you're not supposed to communicate about it. You know, no one's supposed to talk, it's all confidential. However, there's so much speculation that looking back, if you release that NOA at that point in time, maybe you, you lessen the speculation. Here it is, black and white. Here's how many football, here's how many track, here's how many women's basketball. We put out statements, clarifying facts, but until people could really see the notice, then again, that speculation w w was let to, to, to run. And so leading up to the draft night, we didn't know that was coming, obviously. 
when draft night happened, we had a pretty good feel that we knew what it was, that we knew what Laramie meant when he said, yeah, I, I would say yeah, meaning did you get money? He was getting money from our opportunity fund. The staff that were mentioned in those messages were the people that were in charge of the opportunity fund. Just like every other college football program runs an opportunity fund, they can go to staff. That's how it was set up. So we, we had a pretty good feel, but obviously it fueled, again, more public speculation. We had to stop the response to the notice of allegations. We moved, foot, we moved basketball and track forward, but we had to stop football and start a new investigation, if you will. Those things were knocked off the table pretty fast over draft night. Hey, look, we know why this was said. We know what he meant. Laramie provided a, a statement to us and to the NCAA, but it led to that speculation. And so maybe we could have been more aggressive about, hey, draft night was nothing, here's why, let's get to the finish line of this, let's get our notice. However, for whatever reason, the NCAA, they wanted to take a deeper dive and look at other things unbeknownst to us, and that's where we really started to disagree with the NCAA was after draft night. And so our approach moving forward to the second notice of allegations was much more aggressive, much more we should be included, why are you shutting us out, let's be way more aggressive because we disagree with how it was handled procedurally and we disagree with a lot of facts that you're putting out there. So shifted it, very public, you know, looked really bad. You know, here's a young man who walked up to that podium not really knowing the context of all the things that were put out there on social media. And it just fueled all of that. And ironically, you mentioned, hey, where were you? We had a baseball game that night. I, was, I just got off of the broadcast doing an interview with the ESPN crew about our football program and about how, how are we moving forward. And all of a sudden, you know, bam, here we go. And, you know, we had to deal with it you know, in the immediate uh, aftermath of that. Why did it take this almost traumatic crisis to force you guys to look a little bit deeper into your own football program? I mean, obviously the NCAA was, was gonna go take a look, but shouldn't you have been looking for this beforehand too? Shouldn't you have seen this maybe even coming? You know, I, I felt that all along that we were after the truth. Let's get to the bottom of it. If we have to deal with something and own something, then that's what our responsibility is. I think that's what the membership of the NCAA expects you to do, is if you have something, you deal with it. And you hit it head on, you take responsibility. And I felt like we had done that in, in every step of the way of, hey, what is it? Let's hit it head on. If it's, if it's bad, it's bad. If it's a strike, it's a strike. If it's a ball, you know what? We're gonna call it a ball. And we're gonna make sure that everyone knows, whether it's the NCAA staff or whoever, that. This is not true. So I felt like all along, despite a lot of the public narrative that we were running our program, we were checking every box to make sure that we knew who was around our program, are we doing it the right way, the culture, making sure that was correct, making sure our head coach at that time knew of his responsibility. I felt like we were doing all that. We didn't know that there's this other stuff happening, that people were violating covertly our trust. We had a staff member doing it. We had boosters doing it. And so our obligation is what can we control? Can we have the systems in place? Are we educating on those systems? Are we following up? We were doing all those things. When people covertly hide their action, I'm not sure anybody can have any safeguard to deal with that. But that goes back to do you know your people well enough? And we're all responsible for that, and we have to take ownership of that. Sure. You mentioned uh, that you had staff um, doing things covertly, sabotaging the program maybe in a way, uh, and you ended up firing one of your staff members. Some people say that, one, maybe it's a l too little too late, or that he was a sacrificial lamb in all of this. What would you say to that? I would say that every step of the way, whatever information we had, we dealt with it. So we did not, so after draft night, you know, the staff member you're referring to, Barney Farrar, was mentioned in those messages. We got to the bottom of that. Not knowing there was other elements that he was involved with, 
until later that summer. As soon as we found out, as soon as the NCAA let us in on the process, which again, they shut us out of the process for months, we took immediate action. And I think that's how we handled every step of the way when, hey, we have a coach, you know, inadvertently commit violations, we deal with that. If they intentionally commit violations, we deal with that. Once we know the facts, then we hold people accountable. And, and that goes back to the, our disagreement on the institutional control piece is when, when you have something bad happen, you hold people accountable. As soon as we discovered that Barney Farrar was committing violations and he was involved pretty in depth with, with boosters and recruits, we suspended him, we got to the bottom of it, and then we terminated him in early December. So I feel like when you have something, you got to deal with it directly, and I feel like we did that every step of the way. So after the notice was released, you appeared in a video with your chancellor and your then head coach, Hugh Freeze, um, as a sign of unity, or at least that's the way that it was perceived. Some people would say that's very risky. It's risky for the university. Uh, it's risky for you as an athletic director to stand by a coach who you have yet to decide whether or not they were actually involved in any of these infractions. What would you say to that? What was the thinking behind that the strategy? Uh, and would you still have done it knowing what you know today? You know, the, the video, the, it was February of, of 2017 where we announced the, the postseason ban for the 2017 season. Again, you have to go back to that starting point. Do not say anything. Do not talk about it. It's all confidential. Our approach was, hey, let's be transparent. Let's, let's do a press conference. Let's get this out there. Let's be proactive back to the membership expectation of holding yourself accountable you know, self-imposing penalties. Look, we, we had issues. You know, we had issues that were, were fact-based, that we admitted to, you know, that were serious along the way. And so you wanted to take responsibility for that. So we wanted to come out strong and say, look, we get it. We understand. We need to self-impose this postseason ban on our football program. At the same time, you know what, you Freeze had a track record of meeting our expectations in terms of running compliance whether that's documents, whether that's staff meetings, whether that's interacting with compliance, there was a strong, strong fact pattern of how he conducted himself in the compliance world. We had that. You couldn't dispute those, those facts. So he may have been embattled around the, the NCAA compliance front, but we had a very strong fact pattern. And that was part of our whole approach is, again, is it a strike? Is it a ball? In this case, we had facts where he ran the program the right way. So the video, again, you got people telling you, don't say anything. And our approach was, we have to say something. So in some ways, it was a middle ground to do the video, to put the message out there. And I wish we would have been able to take questions. But again, that goes back to all the other people around saying, don't say anything. Our position is, we want to say everything and how do you meet in the middle in more of a controlled in, environment. So I'm glad we got the message out there. I'm glad we were proactive. I wish it would have helped us with the COI in terms of self-imposing that. And that's probably a, a, another realm of this conversation. But I think the video, it was the right thing to get the message out there. It was the right thing to have facts related to our coach. And you know we, we stand behind that aspect of it. So at what point did the pendulum swing far enough for you to realize that maybe you had to make a move and terminate Hugh Freeze as your head coach? This whole thing was a winding road. You know, again, we had starts and stops and the case should have been over and, you know, the Laramie Tunzel situation, both with the stepdad and the, and the draft night. The Hugh Freeze, you know, personal issues became apparent, you know, as part of this whole conversation you know, over phone records and those sort of things. And when we looked into that aspect of it, the, the personal behavior as the leader of, you know, major college football program, any organization, you know, his conduct was, was simply unacceptable. Separating from the NCAA. When we were analyzing, should he be our head coach or not over a, really about a, a five day period, you had to really compartmentalize in a lot of ways, because you couldn't say, hey, 
how does this impact our case adversely, you had to say, should he be our head coach based on his personal conduct? Can we tolerate that? Should we tolerate that? And the answer was no, he could not be. So it was, it was sort of twisted with all the narrative around how we got the phone records and how we, we got to that particular behavior. But we then had to compartmentalize, you know what, there still is a fact pattern of how he ran the program. And the ironic thing is, the enforcement staff had their view of our previous head coach. They did not believe that he was running the program the way he should. The COI, the Committee on Infractions, along with our, our position on Coach Freeze, his very, very good, I think, defense of his position, they believed him. They said, you know what, he did run the compliance pro program the right way. He failed to monitor, but he ran the compliance program the right way. So you, how do you balance those two? You got the enforcement staff thinking one thing, you haven't gone to your committee on infractions yet. He had a personal issue where we had to hold him accountable. And again, it goes back to what's the right thing? What's the right thing to do? Let's do that. And you know, that's the easy part. The hard part is dealing with all this other stuff, but the easy part is the right decision. So that's how we filtered making a decision on our, on our football coach at that time. So let's discuss uh, the Committee on Infractions. First and foremost, it seemed like you were getting some mixed signals. The investigative staff was saying one thing, but of course the Committee on Infractions is going to make their own decisions. Can you tell me a little bit about that process, managing going into the, that meeting with the Committee on Infractions, the, the answer of the Notice of Allegations, how are you strategizing to answer what specifically? And then let's discuss what it's like to go into that room not knowing what awaits you. I feel like I have an honorary law degree, spending a lot of time with, uh, with attorneys on, on this matter. And, you know, I, I think as, as an athletic director, I think you should really and truly understand uh, each allegation. And I, I remember getting some very good uh, advice from uh, former Commissioner Mike Slive. Um, who, who's no longer with us, but he said, Ross, whatever you have, go through each allegation and make sure you understand why it happened, how it happened, and what can you do to try to prevent those things from happening. So I, I think it's very important as an athletic director that you don't just say, well, I'm going I'm to let the attorneys handle that. I'm not going to really study the detail. We have compliance people for that. You have a major case or even a, a lower level case. I think we all need to understand what's happening within our program. So I think as an athletic director, I, I, I heard our council say this, that I was as involved as anyone that they've ever seen that, they, that they've worked with. So I, I think that's very important that the athletic director knows what's happening, knows the details of the case. Do I know every word of every document? No. But knowing the details as much as possible, knowing the big picture strategies, I need to be at the table institutionally. You have to pull in your general counsel. You have to pull in your chancellor. There may be the PR professionals on campus that have to be pulled into it. You obviously have outside counsel. You have the SEC. So there's a lot of people at the table figuring out the strategy. You do all the documents. There's lots of drafts that go back and forth. You get to the final draft. And then you start preparing for the hearing. So we had, we had mock hearings. We'd get a conference room. We'd set it up pretty much like the COI room. We'd have mock hearings. We would ask the, the really tough questions, probably questions that won't be asked, but if you're over-prepared for that meeting, then you can handle it when you walk in the room. So a lot of preparation, a lot of sessions, and we had two of them. We had a women's basketball on a track, so we had that prep. We had a, a very intense football case and hearing, and then we had an appeals hearing. So we had three sessions uh, of preparation to, to really get ready for all of those hearings. So there's a lot of prep work. When you walk in that room on the day of the hearing, um, it's like a hotel ballroom, if you will. And it's set up where you've got the Committee on Infractions at sort of the head of the room. And then on one side is the university. On the other side is the NCAA enforcement staff. There's a court reporter just like you'd see you know, if you were going into a, into a courtroom. The involved parties who are not with the university anymore, so it may be a coach that, that's no longer there, they sit kind of in the middle of the room facing the COI panel. 
And people walk in, you know, typically, you, you know, I know people on the COI, I knew people on, on the panel. You talk to the enforcement staff, you shake hands, everybody sort of provides greetings to one another as you, as you walk around the room. And then you sit down and you take your place and it totally becomes an intense environment. You know, yeah, you can smile and shake hands, but then it's like, okay, it's sort of game day. I, I think it's very, very intense, and, and the tension in the room, you know, is there. You can, you can feel it because everyone wants to make sure that they're accurate and make sure that they get their points across because you're either defending yourself or you're trying to prosecute, if you will, on the enforcement side, and then the, the jury and the judge is the COI. So I would say it's very intense. And the lesson that you learn from that, you never want to be in that room again. You just don't. Because of that intensity, because of the level of detail that you go into, you never want to be in that position um, again. And so me being in there, Matt Luke, our current football coach, being in that room, you learn from that. And you say, you know what, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure this, this never happens again. You mentioned that you did some mock trial, so to speak, and you asked harder questions than what you actually may have seen at the committee. Can you maybe reveal some of those? And were there any situations when you got into that room and the process started that there was a curveball or something came at you that maybe you weren't as prepared for as you should have been? You know, again, as an athletic director, you, you sort of over-prepare and you, you understand a lot of the detail. And so they, they asked me things like you asked earlier about you freeze, you know, tell us, you know, why you took that position, you know, with your football coach, but now he's no longer your coach. You know, that question never came up, but we were prepared, you know, to answer that. Um, the athletic director typically doesn't get a lot of the technical questions. It's more, you know, big picture, you know, conversations that they want to hear from you as the leader of athletics. They want to hear from the chancellor, the chancellor president of the institution carries a lot of weight in that room because they want to know, the COI wants to know, hey, does the university get it? Does athletics get it, but also does the university get it? So prepping the, the chancellor, the CEO of your institution is very, very important. A lot of the detail stuff will be answered by your compliance staff, so they really have to understand the minutia and the detail. Obviously, your legal counsel both inside counsel, outside counsel has to know. So the prep work was, hey, let's make sure we cover everything. So we're over prepared. That way when you get in that room, you don't feel overwhelmed. You feel like you're well versed. So that, that's how we approached the COI hearings. This case is obviously incredibly complex. I think that's maybe the best word to describe it. You guys spent millions of dollars defending yourselves. Um, and you've been here for seven years, and six and a half of those have been in this case. How do you manage all of this as an athletic director? You have an actual job to do, and yet you're managing this process. There's hundreds of people involved. How do you get everyone on the same page? How do you keep your head straight while you're trying to do your actual job and get the university and the athletics department through this? Right. You know, in the meantime of all of this NCAA, you know, case and investigation. We've we've done a lot as a department. You know, built buildings, raised money, academically we're doing well. We've won championships, so we've tried to move the program forward. And so I think the way you have to approach it is you have to have a great staff and really great executive team. That hey, you know what? I've got to focus on this NCAA case, right? That's that's my focus. But how do we move the department forward? Do we need to make a coaching change? And let's get that analysis. Do we need to extend a coach? You've got to do your day job and continue business as usual, but you better have a good staff. You better have an executive team who, who gets it. And then I think it was also important that I was as visible as possible. We have a monthly all staff meeting. We have a dining facility where we are able to interact with a lot of our student athletes and a lot of our staff. So being and maintaining visibility and not hiding throughout this thing, it'd be easy to go in a bunker and hide, and I think visibility uh, of leadership was very important during this transition. The other thing that I think is very important as a, as a leader is we have a saying, never too high, never too low. So I'm standing on the stage at the Sugar Bowl, confetti, trophy, MVP, 
great moment in the history of our program. The Sugar Bowl is really the pinnacle for Ole Miss football based on our history. And I knew a month, month later that we're getting this first notice of allegations. I knew it, standing on that stage going, okay, here we go. We've got to be ready. So we want to celebrate, right? But knowing that there's going to be a low moment, how do you balance that? And I think you've got to just stay reflective. Never too high, never too low. It's probably never as good. It's never as bad. But if I was running down the hall, panicked, that would allow everyone else to be panicked and freak out. Oh my God, what's going to happen? Look at Ross. Look at our leader. Look at the AD. You know, he's freaking out. Boy, maybe it is, maybe it is bad. And so I think keeping a level-headed perspective has helped us through this. It's helped us grow our program despite the challenges. And to me, that's how we've had to, had to manage this whole process. Were you ever worried about your job security? I've had great communication. Despite having some chancellor you know, turnover, I've had great communication with our chancellor, with provost, with general counsel, with board members who govern our university. Every step of the way, they said, hey, we, we've got some challenges but there's no one we'd rather have leading through those challenges than you. I've had stakeholders you know, say the same thing. And so I can only go based on what I'm told, what the actions are. And all I've said was, hey, look, whatever it is, we're gonna deal with it with the right kind of integrity. And you know, if they want my leadership, we'll be here as long as possible. And so I couldn't worry about that. I could not worry about self-preservation I had to do what's best for the institution and doing what's right every step of the way. And then get that reaffirmed by key leaders, which they did all along the way. And I've relied on that to, to move forward and, and try to be confident about what we've done and how we've set the table for future success. And we're gonna get through this. We have gotten through it. And now we can keep moving forward.